Good morning. It's very exciting to be here. It almost seems inconceivable that a year ago, Mayor Taylor came to Houston. In fact, our uh, Parks Director Joe Turner is with us today, who was our host a year ago. And here we are today with 400 people registered. Um, before I open, I do want to recognize Lynn Bobbitt and Tom and Joe, whose uh, leadership has set the stage for everything we're doing today. Um, we're building on the shoulders of Brackenridge and others, and great parks are about great patrons who have great vision, who all know how to measure success. And that's what I'd like to talk about for the next half hour to set the stage for today. So I'm going to come back to this multiple times, and I want you to think about this as you listen to all of our speakers today, and you think about the park moving forward. How do you individually, collectively, as a, a person in a community, in a city, how do you measure success for a park like Brackenridge? Now, what's interesting to me is when, and granted, this sounds like a little ye olde English, if you will, picturesque interest, odd and antiquated foreignness, jumble of races, languages, and buildings, holding to an antiquity, heroic touches in its history to enliven and satisfy a traveler's curiosity. That wasn't said today for the first time. It was said more than 150 years ago by Frederick Law Olmsted, who had come to the city and compared the city to New Orleans and its unrivaled antiquity and complexity. You could think about his words, and you can insert Brackenridge Park now, 150 plus years later. He also went on to talk about the San Antonio Spring may be classified as one of the first waters among the gems of the natural world. The whole river gushes up in one sparkling burst from the earth. Its effect is overpowering. It is beyond your possible conceptions of a spring. We are here to change the way you think about not just the park, but water, and water as the lifeblood of this city for 300 years. We're going to move beyond this man, not Santa Claus, <laughs> Frederick Law Olmsted. <laughs> For some, he is the person that brought a lot of gifts. But what we're going to do is move beyond these guys. George Kessler, who laid out the parks in Dallas. Nope, he didn't work here. It was these guys who built on a larger cultural narrative. And today, we hope to bring some illumination to their contributions to the park. So how do we lift the veil? How do we make this large, layered landscape, layers of history that I call a palimpsest, how do we make that visible? What other park that is a municipal park spans 11,000 years? No wonder the park looks the way it does. It's had a long journey to get to today. Okay, now if you go to the National Register nomination, which was done in 2015, what I found kind of remarkable was to see something that was for a park that didn't begin with a description that was in the 19th century. It began with prehistoric and aboriginal, artifacts, non-Aboriginal, the more traditional historic period where we have the arrival of Europeans in Texas. And then, like many National Register nominations, it had a, a laundry list, if you will, of features that contribute to the integrity of the park. Now, if you try to sort of codify this to show you how rich this is, this is the layers of history in a park. Now imagine if you're a consulting landscape architect and you're doing what's called period plans for a park like this, you've got your work cut out for you. There are this many layers of history that need to be understood and how they knit together to make the mosaic that is the park today. So again, knowing that, how do you measure success? Now this is sort of the traditional approach of often landscape architects. It begins in universities. We say, okay, you're the designers. We know you're radical. You dress in black. You sit in an unladylike fashion. You're the preservers on this side of the room. You're the Athens Garden Club. You have your own parking spaces that only you can park in, and you have wonderful gloves and hats. And then we have our stewards and our ecologists. You'll know the ecologists because they travel with their own turtles. <laughs> now, of course, we're being funny here, but again, think about my question. How do you measure success? Who do you identify with? The students that are here today, the people that are involved in a community meeting, what are your issues? Do you fit in a silo? How do we break those silos? That's why we created the Cultural Landscape Foundation, and our mission is almost parallel with the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. How do we make this larger narrative visible? And a cultural landscape, for example, includes historic sites, historic design landscapes, 
vernacular, those landscapes through use or necessity that have evolved, and ethnographic landscapes involved with the continuing culture. How many American parks can boast all four landscape typologies in one footprint? Our mission, and it was sort of serendip that I get to show the mission, or one of them, I should say, is to make visible, instill value, and engage the public. And that's our mission today as well. So how do you measure success? Now, when I was here last time, I had the good fortune of going over to Alamo Heights and see the restoration work on Rodriguez's Fuabua bus stop. I'm sure many locals know this well. But this is a lot easier to wrap your head around when you're dealing with a static object for stewardship excellence. But what about a park like Brackenridge? When you put Rodriguez's work in context and you start to see this stuff all around it, is this a dignified setting for one of the oldest buildings in the park? Is this a dignified setting for Rodriguez's work? What about this bridge? And as you approach the bridge and having a dignified arrival experience, you have all this other stuff. And you've arrived. Welcome. Am I excited about what I'm seeing? What happens along the edge? And I'll come back to edge later. You know, for those of us back east, we're, we're used to a park meeting the edge of a street in a neighborhood. And now we have a little peekaboo game with the park. Now you see it, now you don't. So how do we work with that edge? This is what's happened in the park, I think, over the last decades, is that in response to community wants, there has been things that are introduced. It's what I call plop and drop, or poo-poo platters for the ADD generation. <laughs> but today, we aim to elevate the discourse. How do you measure success? Well, it's easy in sports. You win or you lose. It's easy when we're dealing with green building standards. It's easy if you're a tree hugger. It's easier if you're dealing with understanding climate change, especially when you see dramatic climate events that affect the place where you live. In 1921, in 1946, for example, in 1985, right in the park where you see two employees of Alamo concessions trying to rescue paddle boats. This is a part of everyday life today. So how do we balance these multiple systems when we're dealing with nature that is all too dynamic. But we also have a foundation to build upon, to understand the park and its network that are connected through water. How does that inform present day interventions? The fact that this site is unrivaled in terms of its archeology, span what do we do with that? How do we daylight that while still being good stewards? How do we deal with sites that are complex and I would argue unrivaled in our history in terms of its innovation more than a century ago? And how do we engage the public beyond text and sign panels? Um, here, for example, and I'm, I will confess that I'm a fan of these, I think there's a lot that's conveyed at the Alamo when you move through here and you see the different periods that are its palimpsest. But people are historically and today have always had a freedom of mobility through the park. How do we channel those cultural life ways to have all of these folks become ambassadors for the park? We have a rich history of cultural narratives, some good and some not so good. Um, here, of course, was the renaming of the Japanese garden during the Second World War. You can still see the sign that says Chinese Tea Garden. But do we know about the Jinji family and the role that they played in the park? Do we know the story of the son going off uh, actually getting the Purple Heart, and then the family having to leave the park during the war years. What does that mean in our collective narrative? You could apply this to golf. You can apply this to women and feminist gender studies. How do these cultural lifeways inform decision-making so we're not merely looking at who designed a golf course or whether or not golf plays a role in our culture today what are those sets of quantifiable decision-making tools that we have to move the park forward that recognize these rich and overlapping lifeways? And present day uses, beloved, celebrated. Um, when I see the photos of these events, I think, gosh, I just wanna go there and overnight and be part of those festivities. How do we harness that energy? And it's not just human. It can be fish or fowl, 
And what's interesting to me is to see these historic postcards where actually the fowl were celebrated. We had the Brackenridge Park swans. It almost sounds like Ziegfeld Follies, like they were kind of coming through here doing their water dances. And then we have community groups that are interacting with the park by their own missions. Uh, for example, the San Antonio Garden Clubs, and I'm sure we have members here today, there's over two dozen local clubs. How do we engage them in this process? They're part of the Lifeways today. And I think the other underpinning thing for us to recognize, and this is well documented throughout the US, 70 to 80% of park uses of parks of this scale, over 300 acres, 500 acres, are for passive use. They just may not, by their very nature, be the most vocal. So how do we take the successes that we apply to buildings and turn them inside out? This is, of course, the tea house, which has undergone a very wonderful rehabilitation. Now, I would say for those of you in the public that maybe are getting the whiplash at this point from me, I would say if you take maybe a few things away today, this would be one of them. Think about a landscape like Brackenridge Park as a collection of four C's. Collections which are both living and non-living, the community, all of us that live, work, and play here. Containers, because the buildings are features in the landscape. I'm gonna say that again. The buildings are features in the landscape not the other way around. And then context. The context is both the physical setting and the historical framework. So to illuminate now what I mean by this, in Brackenridge Park, for example, when this was listed as one of the state antiquity landmarks, the city archeologist was quoted as saying, the new designation reflects not only the park's archeological treasures, but also its standing structures. So in this case, when I read a statement like this, I think the landscape is the parsley around the roast, to quote Tommy Church. But it is much more than that. So let's begin with historic context. Think about Russian nesting dolls. How do we fit Brackenridge Park into the larger municipal park movement? Now, you guys probably recognize the park on the bottom. And if you go to the Wikipedia page for San Pedro Springs, it will say it's the second oldest park in the US after the public garden. The challenge is the public garden is a garden. It's not a park. So here, for example, you see San Pedro Springs is 1852. Most of the textbooks say Bushnell Park in Hartford is the oldest, but I can tell you that a year before San Antonio was Forsyth Park in Savannah in 1851. So how do you manage change if we don't understand how significant these landscapes are when we apply that criteria to buildings? We can apply it to Rodriguez's work, for example, who I just, I'm ready to go on a national tour to see his work in Memphis and in Little Rock. Um, this work is delicious, both in terms of its craftsmanship, but also the larger cultural narrative. And then sites like the Japanese garden. And you realize that probably is the first quarry that was turned into a garden in the US, not North America, Butchard Gardens in BC, Victoria, 1909, but look at this. This is a typology that plays out today. Um, most recently, the Quarry Garden in Shanghai. So we now see this recycling of active industrial uses. It happened here a century ago. I would argue that the garden in its own right is a candidate as a national historic landmark. And then how do we begin to think about the park more broadly? I'd be curious, I know we have some folks coming from the West Coast today. I would suggest that, the, that Brackenridge Park is the municipal park equivalent of the Presidio, illustrating the broadest possible period of significance for any, in this case, municipal park in America. What does that mean? Is it possible that it's because it's the first water supply system in America that this is a part of it? Is it possible that there's a much larger story here to tell about artisanal groundwater systems. This needs to be unlocked as we think about how these resources fit together. And how do we connect the dots? Whether it's San Pedro Springs, the Blue Hole, or the remnants of the reservoir that's in the San Antonio Botanical Gardens, all of these places are linked by water. Is there another American city that can tell this story with such portals, such Alice in Wonderland holes for young children to find their way into today. Because if it exists, I don't know it. And sadly, um, because this is taken my animation, you can't see what's underneath, but it is the definition of what is a national heritage area. And although the missions are part of a World Heritage District, 
What's interesting to me is that if we look at the story of water, it all could be linked through what's called the National Heritage Area. There are 49 of these in the US, and you'll notice in looking at the map, there's not one in Texas. The other thing I can tell you for National Heritage Areas in places like the New York Harbor Parks with Statue of Liberty and at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, which are World Heritage Sites, those are also National Heritage Areas that include World Heritage Sites. I believe that the story of water and San Antonio connecting the missions with the larger landscape of the park and these other resources is a prospect for a National Heritage Area, thus elevating the significance of Brackenridge Park to a larger audience, both locally, nationally, and I would argue internationally. And I mentioned that I would come back to EDGE. Uh, this is uh, the Chicago Waterfront Park by one of our afternoon speakers, Gina Ford, and Gina knows better than anyone that EDGE matters. And it matters a lot here at the park. I'm not talking about this dude. <laughs> I'm not talking about this film during Alec Baldwin's hot period. <laughs> and I'm not talking about a close shave. What I'm talking about is being next to a park, and what does that mean? Now here, for example, is the official map of the Central Park Conservancy. And you'll notice on the right-hand side that the Metropolitan Museum is depicted as the park meeting the building. The green meets the structure. And this was always the intent, I believe, of the park historically. And in fact, the great city planner Harlan Bartholomew, when he was working in the city, you see that he created a very Olmstead-like parkway that would be like a film, a scenographic experience revealing itself, but this didn't come to be. And you can see, for example, along the Broadway edge that the park doesn't always meet the street. And what I think is interesting is if you look at the description here about visiting the Witty, for example, it says parking and directions, the Witty Museum is located in Brackenridge Park. But if you look at the map, our green, our, how our mind works if we're Google people and we use Google Maps, is that the park isn't shown green here, it's shown as open space. And then throughout the park, this open space has a value. And so the question is, what is the message that we're sending throughout the park if we don't begin to recognize how edge matters and how we also send a message about where the park is and how the park contributes holistically to the quality of that larger landscape. This is like surgery. It's like opening a can. We have to open up the park, make it porous. Just as was done by Lori Olin in New York City in a seminal work with the uh, urbanist and critic Holly White, you see before and afters of opening what was then known as Needle Park and you see it opening up historically. You see more recently when the fence just came down two years ago for restoration work, what happened when it was removed? Everyone began to populate it. The park became porous. And New York City, under the current parks director uh, leadership, Mitch Silver, is looking at making parks without borders. How do we open up the park? This has also happened at Lincoln Center. And I love this sort of piece in the New York Times, meaning that it's easier to tell what's going on and where. At Lincoln Center, you can see, creating a more porous and interactive relationship between the city at large and institutions that ultimately prosper in the open. How do you measure success? That's one way I measure success. And you can see in Houston, through the success of Discovery Green by Hargraves and Mary Margaret Jones. You can see they're so successful now that edges of the park, which had turned their back on the community, have now looked at redesigning these edges to open them up and announce their presence for their neighbors. Mayor Taylor, I think, said it best. We know how she measures success, and I know she'll tell us more this afternoon. Um, and, and she says, in San Antonio, as we approach 300 years of existence, we're trying to create an emotional relationship between place, history, ecology, and people, a cultural landscape. So if we're dealing with 300 year, years of history, how do we work on this landscape? Think of it as a text, as a manuscript that we all have the luxury of understanding before we begin an editorial process. And to illustrate how that editing matters and why context, this moment on March 3rd in 2017 to illustrate context, 
I show you this image. <laughs> now, to look at this image, you have to not only understand what's been happening in the news the last week in terms of photographic journalism, but you also have to understand the work of Andrew Wyeth and Christina's world. Context matters, and context in a, context in a moment matters. People will watch this video on YouTube and think, what is this dude talking about a year from now? So imagine, for example, if you approach a Beaux-Arts design that's part of a city fabric. These are images that I've taken. You can see the car in this first image since I've been coming here 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Then you start to see additions and more additions. How do you measure success? Is open space up for grabs? Because a structure is there and we put a playground in, the fact that we've created a, a, a Beaux-Arts symmetrical relationship with it, is that successful? How do you measure success? Yes, it's great to have a playground. The question is, how do you do it? Uh, this is actually Prospect Park in the 1980s. These are not torture devices. This is an actual bench. <laughs> We forget that this is what the park looked like. In fact, Patricia O'Donnell, who is here today, is the person standing on what was a scenic overlook in 1984. But this is the new Lakeside Center. And you can see that this is a modernist insertion in a historic design masterwork by Olmsted and Vox. And here's a before of its setting, and here's an after. It is possible to restore visual and spatial relationships in a landscape and still introduce new features without diminishing the quality of the historic design or the visitor experience. And we saw this in Herman Park, with the heart of the park done by SWA and Olin. Uh, here was the original project. And then most recently, now you can see the work that Michael Van Valkenburg's Associates is involved in currently for what they call the remaining in-between landscapes. That's the hard stuff, and that's the hard stuff here for the Conservancy, I believe, as well is these interstitial spaces and edges. And of course, the High Line. One needs not say much about this. It speaks for itself. I have never seen so many happy people in New York in one place, ever. <laughs> and you could say the same, I would say, for the Pearl, where I think, and we'll hear more about this from Christy this morning. Um, for me, the first time I came here, I was completely knocked out of my seat that here was a place that spoke its own, its own language with dignity and uniqueness that is not to be found anywhere else and is the perfect place to have this event. And I want to thank Pearl for their sponsorship and support. So let's talk about Green. You, you missed all the drama. that You were supposed to see Joan Crawford and then this was going to float up. I didn't realize that she was from San Antonio. But what we're talking about in all of this work is great bone structure. How do we deal with that for a park that spans 11,000 years? I'll leave you with two last points. The first, and I will challenge our panelists, I haven't told them I would mention this today, the idea of authenticity. What does authenticity mean as we look at the park? The New York Times has reported that authenticity is the value of the moment. And I would say for those that come to us today from the preservation community, and I see Vince uh, scribbling in the front row here, uh, Vince, when I see the National Register criteria, and I think of feeling and association as one of the seven qualities of integrity, which are here and here. How do we capture that? It's not like we're going to send people out with mood rings in the park and gauge their experiences, but I will tell you that I feel that all my buttons get pushed here at Pearl in, in the best possible way as I move through this landscape. It is emotionally powerful and stirring, and you are just Glad to be in the place. Now, Anderson Cooper said, in everything I've done, I've always tried to be authentic and real. I don't know what he's doing here in this photograph. <laughs> but I will tell you, if you Google authenticity, the numbers are off the charts. They're growing by the millions. We talk about it in film. We talk about it in religion. We talk about it in dance and movement. We talk about it in music and performance. We talk about it in cooking. Here's one of my favorites. Mexican food, not only do people want authenticity, but 70% of Americans want it not only in a Mexican restaurant, they want it served by Mexicans. Go figure. Authenticity in the garden. Claire, Claire Sawyer says five principles for cultivating a sense of place. <laughs>
and as Brackenridge Park looks forward, authenticity as at the heart of successful fundraising. So what does that mean for a park that has 11,000 years of history? How do we value what is real? How do we make it visible and engage 21st century populace? How do you measure success? I'll leave you with these three thoughts. Well, actually, right before that, I'll show you. I was, it's always funny when you, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a news junkie. So it was interesting when I read about the new witty, and I was really excited to see the kind of opportunities for engagement that are being created here. For example, was one of the, peop the people of the Pecos were sculptured with the measurements and dimensions of actual human bones. I mean, talk about authenticity, this quest for that level of accuracy. The same day that I read this on a Saturday after it came out, I opened the New York Times and on the front page, I don't know how many people saw this story, but on the anniversary of Walden, there's a new video game. Who would have thought Walden as a video game? The game takes six hours to play. It starts in the summer and ends a year later, offering players tasks like building a cabin, planting beans, or chatting, virtually, of course, with Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> Should you not have sufficient time for contemplation or work too hard, the game cautions, your inspiration has become low, but can be regained by reading, attending to the sound of life in the distance, enjoy solitude and interacting with visitors, animals, and humans. I think, is this gonna be done in the voice of James Earl Jones? <laughs> then this is intriguing. Here's the head of the Game Innovation Lab at USC. Thoreau was sitting in a moment when life was beginning to speed up, and he identified that asking, are our lives better because we now live on railroad time? We have to ask ourselves the same question today. Are our lives better because we live on internet time? So what does this mean for the park, and in particular, young people moving forward? I leave you with these three thoughts. One, look at the Smithsonian survey as you consider these images of the Alamo. 14 Smithsonian institutions over a two-year period, number one, People want to see the real thing. Gain information and insights, spend time with family and friends, feel awe and wonder, and feel pride in America. What does that mean for moving the park forward? I would say one, experience is more important than destination. Two, historic places serve as educators for history. And three, increased competition requires stewards to provide high quality, authentic experiences. So today, just one bit of housekeeping. We're going to have two panels, one in the morning, one this afternoon. Everyone should know that all the panelists were asked to consider the following questions through the lens of Brackenridge Park as they present. The first is about resources, the second is about balancing natural, scenic, cultural, historic, and ecological values. Third, addressing public-private partnerships. Four, types of engagement and lessons learned. Five, long-term management and maintenance challenges. And finally, did the work that you're speaking to present in a change of attitude, perception, or opinion of the landscape? This morning's panel, which will be moderated by Leila Powell, We'll look at the, in very broadly, why plan, local success stories, and what we can learn here at Breckenridge Park from them. This afternoon, we'll have a panel that looks at solutions-oriented examples from outside of San Antonio. I also wanna mention that all of the people that are presenting this afternoon came in advance, spent time in the park, and are now back to revisit their ideas following the visit that they did here some two to three days in many cases. And finally, the rules. If you will see I'm holding up signs that are in horrible red ink that say five minutes, three minutes, one minute, stop. 10 minutes for the moderator, 23 minutes for each presentation. We'll have two respondents or in each of the panels that will speak for seven minutes, then all of the panelists will come back on stage for a facilitated dialogue. I wanna thank you all Enjoy yourselves, and thank you for coming today.